Thanks for the kind invitation, introduction. I'm very grateful. It's my first day ever to Korea. <laughs> and I uh, discover a lot. And um, I'm not an AI specialist. That is probably why I was invited <laughs> to the symposium. And um, I'm also not really wearing my university hat today, but would like to focus more on curatorial projects. I'm also a producer, I'm a curator, and I do kind of writing um, that is about biomediality. And uh, I think the role I have here in this symposium is uh, to open up the scope of thinking AI as a kind of current contemporary hype a little bit beyond and to address some of the underlying problematics. And my work is maybe as a kind of media art scholar about uh, new media, while we know that in media studies the newness factor is already very old. And um, of course, we're not only dealing with artificial intelligence, but also artificial life comes back. We are also dealing with other topics such as biotechnologies, including synthetic biologies. And I will try to see in how far the epistemologically aware media arts um, contrast very often the affirmative and apologetic positions and that maybe artists' role is also to go beyond mainstream applications. This is what I want to do with my title today, which I um, yeah, chose Challenging Anthropocentrism in Art and AI from Microperformativity and Macro Effects in, to Greenness Studies. And um, also, I'm acting as a jury member at the Ars Electronica Festival in Linz with its competition AI and Life Arts. And uh, first, most often today, intelligence in relation uh, to that is uh, understood in terms of a machine's ability to perform the cognitive functions we associate with the human mind. And, but what about intelligence of other species? And second, artificiality denotes the quality of being made by human beings uh, rather than occurring naturally. And this is, of course, still a modernist principle which has become much under attack in nature cultures debate in the last two decades. So in the second part of my talk, I will therefore try to use two curatorial and theoretical strategies mentioned in the title to challenge anthropocentrism, microperformativity as an attempt to stage emphasized the inherent agency of non-human actors which go beyond beyond our classical understanding as human as the only valid technological actor. And second, what I call green studies and ungreening greening as a strategy by which I describe green as the most anthropocentric and ambiguous color to be deconstructed, um, including in AI. So there's a lot of debate whether AI develops creativity, imagination, consciousness, and, and or if it can make conceptually new art. But in practice, the largely dominant part reduces the complex notion of art to flat images created by generative adversarial networks, text image generators, and depending on what one feeds, the GAN engine and often producing a striking aesthetic monoculture, including in works bought by large museums. So in, in a provocative manner, uh, we may remind, or they remind me in their cheesy brilliance, as if Salvador Dali had nightmares, which is precisely the title of this art image by an anonymous user. And this inflationary use of screens also, which since the 1970s seemed to grow larger and larger every year, not unlike hyper-consumerist invasive SUV cars, contributes also to the aesthetic monoculture at this surface level. And some institutions, of course, see these images also as a way to attract new audiences to apply AI to older contents, such as the Dali Museum in Florida, where visitors can enter a description of their dreams via cell phone in order to participate in an ever-evolving collective dream tapestry. While the pun is intended to use the homophonic text-to-image uh, AI systems called DALI, named in part as a reference to the iconic artist Salvador Dali. So the claim is to uh, transform personal dreams into visions with text-to-image generators while taking Dali's own interest in science and technology to revolutionize the museum experience here. But
But however, this photorealistic imagery poses a question, on the one hand, in how far these descriptive human language really captures dreams, and then also while the AI fully depends on this verbally biased data sets. And on the other, the piece also illustrates the regression that artists using supposedly new media attempted to mistake images for art and neglect the very qualities of experimental media art, such we have seen with Namjoon Paik, since the 60s, namely to critically focus not on the aesthetic output or product, but to reveal the hidden mechanisms of the machines, used in ways not written in the user's manual, staging intermedia, not multimedia art. And hence this sketch from MTAA, that is Michael Scarf and Tim Wooden, called Simple Net Art Diagram from 97, which is an animated GIF, blinking red flash here, showing this relational space, instead of fluting screens with visual content, is of greater actuality than ever. And it aims to actually emphasize that the quality of media and the artwork does not rely on visual outputs, then on the critical and the techno-epistemological analysis, uh, and staging of what happens between the machines, which all the socio-technological negotiations and computational infrastructures are involved. And a similar animation was proposed around the same time by media artist Jim Campbell with this highly iconic formula of computer art. Here, arbitrary data inputs, internet activity, stock prices, and so on, are transcoded into likewise arbitrary outputs, which results in different interactions, such as images, sound, robotic, actuators, or even wind, while this black box of the algorithms just performs affirmatively what algorithms do anyway, resulting in structurally resembling interactive works that we've seen as data translation art forever, but which do not address the core of the machinic processes itself. So biased black boxes hide away the conditions of their constructedness and the identities of the constructors alike. And the irony is that this GIF animation, if you search for it now on the internet, is no longer supported by most of our browsers, and critically it's silenced down by its technological obsolescence. So, uh, now I want to briefly talk about how AI has recently unfolded, of course, as an institutional hype that hypes that we know, to use its agenda-setting potential to allegedly update and upgrade festivals and competitions in the quest and the possibility of need uh, of, to prove their, the reasons of existence through ever new, new media. And a good example is this pre Ars Electronica in Linz, Austria, where I'm serving as a jury member since 2007 in the then newly created category Hybrid Art, following the festival's theme two years earlier, and which revealed a shift in the interest of new media um, beyond the information technologies towards material technologies, biological, chemical, mechanical, nanotechnological, and drawing from the original etymological meaning of the term hybrid, even in the biological sense of the term, producing forms, media constellation, or even living entities by mixing. So for 12 years, this category before became the most regarded, uh, eclectic and innovative forum welcoming cultural forms, which could not be grafted even in existing genres such as interactive sound or animation art, but also including artworks based on artificial life, artificial intelligence, but also synthetic biology and maybe also genetic engineering. However, in 2019 then, in the light of the growing societal endeavors related to the perceived exponential growth of AI as a method and topic, Ars Electronica decided to rename and refashion this hybrid art category as AI and life arts. And what is surprising, though, is that the content and the disciplinary orientations stayed the same, reaching from machine and deep learning, robotics and prosthetics on the one side, to literally earth involving genetic engineering, synthetic biology, or addressing environmental issues and biodiversity. And most intriguing, the term hybrid art as a large and encompassing term now is listed as a subcategory in the nevertheless narrower concepts of AI and life arts. So obviously this has to do something with the dynamics of what Milton Lim has described as the history of AI winters and summers. 
Lim describes that despite the conceptual foundations of the field established in the 50s by Alan Turing with the question, can machines do what we humans as thinking entities do? The development of the field paused between 1974 and 1980 and 1987 and 93, but since then growing exponentially as computational speed and power increased and boosted especially so-called symbolic AI. And uh, historically speaking, Margaret Bowden, in a very short but nevertheless very sharp introduction to artificial intelligence, has described how the fields of artificial intelligence and artificial life research were still evolving hand in hand together before a significant schism occurred in the 1960s and resulting in more and more antagonistic battles resulting in dichotomies, life versus mind, biological versus psychological, thus oscillating between cybernetic interest in self organization, uh, autonomy, adaptation, uh, regulation, and symbolic and computational approaches with a focus on intelligence, but intelligence understood as information processing capacities, programming languages, machine learning, and the modeling of human-like capacities and consciousness. So it is in the latter that we generally talk about today as the AI. And even if these areas merged uh, in disciplines such as situated robotics or soft robotics, distributed cognition and technological hybrids composed of analog, digital and hard, soft and wetware systems, in the sense Stephen Fox talks about MI, not AI, meaning multi-agency, combining natural and artificial intelligence in hybrid beings and systems. And when we organized our 2019 festival and conference in Riga together with Latvian Media Arts Center Rixi, in order to challenge the dominant version that symbolic AI had become, I proposed and coined the term NAI as a kind of provocative neologism, and the, the N of which both referring to the negation of the aesthetic quantum loop that many expected that AI applied to the arts would provide, and, and the other to naturally artificial intelligence, meaning to have a look at the inherent technical capacities in other than human organisms, such as the cognitive potential, for example, in bacteria, and promoting a systemic and critical approach in which intelligence may not just refer to the mimicking of human cognition, but rather even to the decentralized intelligence of ecosystems, systems which are even capable of cleaning up humankind's mess in times of major ecological and atmospheric crisis. And such position has been also put forward, among others, by uh, um, Dario Floriano and Claudio Matissu in their book Bio-Inspired Artificial Intelligence Series. Um, they argue, as early as in 2008, that for almost 50 years, mainstream artificial intelligence focusing on creating computers and algorithms that displayed human cognitive abilities and thereby departed from its original source of interaction, which is biological intelligence. And then limiting research to efficient signal processing, optimal control and data mining. So they complain that AI today uh, neglects fundamental aspects of biological intelligence, such as physical embodiment and behavioral autonomy, and lists seven fields of bio-inspired AI, which more or less corresponds to what I tried to call NIE. So, a good example of how such NAI could unfold as artwork is provided by Slovenian artist Bela Petris with her performative installation Play. So play or play, uh, of course there is playfully, the PL, and there is AI, there is also plant intelligence there and play deals with inhumanly slow play between concumber plants, intelligent concumber plants, and an AI robot. And based on captured images, the computer predicts how the plant will grow, adjusting its robotic tendrils accordingly. And the plant, uh, constantly reaching for these tendrils, starts to intervene in the neural network's learning processes. So the AI and the plant learn about each other, but also in a temporality that is inaccessible to human observers. 
A good process, uh, and I recognize some of the Sisyphus stone kind of structures here, that's a parallel maybe to um, Anna Riddler's work, so where uh, biological agency is also one of the core of this AI-based long-term art projects, so um, whom we welcomed uh, recently in last month to a crypto climate and art conference a month ago in Riga. Uh, Riddler's Myriad Tulips project draws historical parallels between tulip mania, such as AI mania today, that swept across Europe in the 17th century and the current speculations about digital cryptocurrencies. And this piece consists of thousands of hand-labeled photographs of tulips, which then serve as a data set used by an AI. But there, what is at stake here is the manual making of this data sets, which points to the overlooked skill, labor, and time usually hidden by these algorithmic processes. So Rittler was buying, moving, stripping, hundreds and hundreds of tulips herself, photographed them and then labeled them according to her very personal criteria. So we often forget in the digital age that information is physical and that things seen on a screen once may have started in the real world. Um, so there is also um, symbiotic AI instead of symbolic AI proposed by a Chinese artist, uh, and I'm not sure about the pronunciation, I'm sorry, C-O-U-Q. It exists of a role play where participants, um, human participants, they play a role, and by playing this role, they represent different agents of an ecosystem, and then interact with a pre-programmed weather forecast AI with still human-centric data sets. What time is this, what weather it's going tomorrow, it's just raining, do I need my umbrella and so on, and forcing this AI to unlearn its bias and taking into account positions of trees, milkweeds, butterflies, lichens or fungi. So slowly forming a kind of cybernetic language of symbiosis. And the aim is to suggest that bias is present, of course, in most data sets, and how non-human perspectives should be integrating so that the AI system learns how it's situated in the environment. And we have had this in your key talk before, the very notion of contextual information and situatedness. So, of course, this piece is uh, just one of the many that goes in this direction of ecosystemic uh, applications of AI. And uh, it's... Um, um, seems to resonate with an often asked question, namely whether an AI could, should be considered as a new species, such as we were encouraged to discuss here at this roundtable discussion at the last ICEA in Paris, organized by the French-Canadian artist community. And while the answer was mainly no, the question itself reveals that we try to naturalize these new tools as a kind of biological ontologization. And this brings me now to my two research angles with regards to how media art with an epistemological self-awareness may challenge these bespoke anthropocentrism, um, microperformativity and greenness studies. So to start, and I brought a copy of that, um, we just finished to, to publish this um, piece with Rutledge, uh, with performance research and it's a 44 authors thinking about the very notion of microperformativity, which is a term I worked on since 2003. And um, yeah, it uh, denotes the concept, uh, trend in theory and artistic practice to destabilize human scales, both spatial and temporal, as the dominant plane of reference. And instead, uh, emphasize biological and technological micro-agencies that beyond this mesoscopic human body relate to the invisibility of the microscopic and the incomprehensibility of the macroscopic. So we choose uh, as a kind of micro-performance a uh, blue remix by Geneva-based performer artist uh, Jan Marusic as a cover image for two reasons. First, um, it subverts the tradition um, within human phenomenological considerations, um, displacing the focus from 
actions to microscopic functions, from physical gestures to physiological processes, from staged diegetic time to real performative time. And in this mesmerizing one hour long physiological performance, the former dancer, becoming bored by dance, uh, Marusic staged a controlled biochemical choreography of methylene blue, which progressively seeps out of all his orifices of the body, from eyes, mouth, and nose to the skin, while internal bodily sounds are amplified and remixed by a DJ, so shifting the viewer's attention from the physical to the physiological state. And second, it also um, relates to vegetality in the very polysemic sense, not only meaning the quality of being a plant or being vegetal, but also what we uh, very often associate with passiveness, the vegetative system that controls our visual nervous system. And uh, of course, this is very much in contract. This is automatic. We don't have any control of that. It's uh, affecting functions such as metabolic activity, breathing, and heartbeat. Beyond categories such as intentionality or subjectivity, central holds in, um, to be important for human agency. In a similar way, um, we have a, a micro-performative piece here in Spieler Petrich, 20 hour long performance called Poesis, which can be also, it's just an uh, encounter between human life and vegetal otherness as co-performance, adjusting their rhythms and functions. Here, the artist and germinating crest and vis-a-vis -vis each other, illuminated by a strong artificial light. And um, the artist uh, body uh, signals the plants to respond by changing their shape and color so that they, in turn, the, the, the plants um, actually produce a living imprint of the artist Juliet. So the artist is producing a phenomenon called etiolation, resulting both in the paling and lengthening of the, cell, the, the crescent stems, uh, which is contrasted by her own human shrinking high due to the persistent stillness. So the crest is growing very, very slowly. So this is a kind of micro gestures across species boundaries. But we have other artists, such as Russian artists, and we staged this for the first time in Munich, uh, Yulia Borovaya. It's um, growing crystals. And you see these crystals in one hour just covering as dendrites the whole artist's body. So it's mixing the kind of, um, yeah, the, the growth of the crystals with the, 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 the human skin. Or we have a performance by uh, Tina Topgott working with mealworms. A human performer interacts with thousands of mealworms. Non-human performers sought to slow down audiences to get in touch with decay, decomposition, and death. And under this dome, multiple cycles of life create constant changes to the landscape, produce a soundscape by eating polystyrene, so cleaning up human mess and digesting plastic due to their microbiome and the bacterial agencies. So they actually dispose of human waste and create by that a unique, unique soundscape. Um, we managed to um, uh, organize quite a lot of um, um, of, uh, of art shows and exhibitions recently about this topic, such as applied microperformativity at the Academy in Vienna. Um, maybe the most challenging work I curated, and it took seven years to curate this piece for a performance that can only be performed once, because the second time it would be lethal. Um, so it's about human-animal relationships, it's about the complexity of immunal and immune communication and microscopic agencies at that level. And this self-experimentation piece, May the Horse Live in Me, by French duo A Orienté Objet, in which uh, artist Marion laval Jonté was injected with horse blood that was compatibilized to experience immune otherness in an act of transspecies blood brother or sisterhood. And the artist turned herself into a guinea pig and herself over the course of the months injecting herself with horse immunoglobins to develop a tolerance to these foreign microbodies and then to be injected without falling into an anaphylactic shock so that the horse immunoglobins would bypass the defense mechanisms and enter her bloodstreams bound with the proteins and have an impact on her sleep patterns and other endocrine information. More recently, 
Javel-Jonté also carried out micro art, microbiome-based art experiences uh, consisting of grafting the rich microbiota of a pygmy inhabitant of the African primordial forest onto the artist to potentially learn to feel as a real physiological experience the forest environment thanks to the transplant of an internal ecosystem. Um, so this is just a list that we compiled from our special issue on microperformativity. So these are the performers of today or of tomorrow, from extraterrestrial organic matter to pheromones to, of course, body liquids, amino acids, signaling proteins. I mean, AI is somewhere in there. I think there is uh, artificial intelligence-based deep learning networks and corporate surveillance systems, high-frequency trading algorithms. But of course, there are a lot of micro agencies on the biological level that AI is probably not thinking or dealing with. Um, okay, this has to do, of course, with the conception of what a body may be or is. And um, yeah, um, traditionally, performance has been about the encounter between an artistic entity or presentation and its perceivers about co corporality. And um, today we have maybe to think of performance and performativity in terms and other of just human agency and to redefine what a body is. In Latin, for example, in corpus, it's just organized physical substance. The term body does not at all imply any scale or nature and is not anthropocentric by definition. So we currently witness this kind of attempt to escape the scales represented in Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, in which the human body and its ideal proportion establish analogies for the logics of architecture and other disciplines. Here is metrics such as genetics, but also microbiome. And we have a subversion of the Vitruvian man and more generally the human scale as a reference point in the light of other metrics and logics. Um, artworks um, that come to mind are, for example, Mexican artist Gilberto Esparza, um, um, where the bodies both of the plantas nomodas and plantas autophotosyntheticas are conceived as decentralized intelligent ecosystems containing bacteria in microbial fuel cells to produce energy for the robotic actions. And they use energy extracted by DIY microbial fuel cells from wastewater to produce light that then the aquatic plants and cyanobacteria require to conduct photosynthesis. And the not so individual creature seems to have organs, but distributed ones, and functions as a hybrid of a gastrobot and the biomusical bio synthesizers. So they combine hardware, software with wetware to purify polluted water, filter out chemicals, release oxygen, and becoming increasingly self-sufficient as they learn to navigate. And if they are said to express autonomous or intelligent behavior, this might not result in the mimicking of human cognition, but rather in the system's distributed intelligence to clean up humans' mess in times of major ecological crisis. Um, I just want to mention some other works, such as Self, also a piece, a sound piece, where the artist Guy Binaria from Australia has been culturing his own neuron cells to enter, interact with live musicians. And we have many, I mean, ways how to to, to describe the evolution of the notion of performativity. Of course, it comes from linguistics, from John Austin, the enacting of something, not a description through language. We have it in gender theory to construct performatively gender in and over time. We have performativity as a motor in anthropology and sociology, in um, Victor Turner's um, uh, studies where the performative becomes a kind of vector of understanding, a kind of method and finally also in, in STS, in the science and technology studies, we actually be studying performatively functioning experimental systems with all the micro agencies. I don't want to go into this diagram here, but of course this is a whole map of how performance and performativity theory today unfold in different areas that largely beyond go beyond art. This also asks the question of what are then the audiences of this kind of art. And there's a nice piece here um, by, um, um, it's called the e-feeder. 
And it leads to the question for whom performative modes on non-human agencies are actually staged and whether human audiences should really be the only receivers. And if one makes cell or microbe art for humans, why not make human art for microbes? And this e-feeder hooks up biotechnological arrangements which artificial intelligence-based agency here, a Zoom web interface tracks human facial expressions to be classified by an artificial intelligence face recognition algorithm and then translate the results, um, joy, sadness, anger, into physical chemical inputs that impact on the behavior of E. coli bacterial colonies. So positive facial expression translates in the administration of glucoses or makes them happy, negative ones, destructive UVC light. So you can communicate non-verbally with the bacteria while your bad mood has potentially a lethal impact on the microbial audience. There's a lot of artwork and I'm really skipping that dealing with bacteria and how bacteria in art over the last 30 years as micro performers have been fulfilling several roles and uh, decomposing sculptures as here in the case of Thomas Feuerstein using bacteria dissolve a marble sculpture of 2000 uh, kilograms and then grow a living liver sculpture out of the nutrients from the decomposed marble sculpture we have bacteria that regrow destroyed frescoes, such in the work by Edgar Lissel. Or we have also the Colosseum in Rome, which only survives as a kind of cultural artifact of heritage because of uh, um, calcifying bacteria, conserving the surface, being revealed by artists. Or artists also staging gold digger bacteria, such as extremophile, which are able to produce 24 karat gold, such as in Adam Brown's piece. Also working on the level of what I call greenness studies, and I maybe take the last five minutes, if I have, uh, for just introducing what I mean by greenness studies. Uh, is it okay if you go for five minutes? Okay. So. Um, He's also an artist and together with Adam Brown we direct a residency project which called The Bridge at Michigan State University which we founded in 2015. We invite artists also to work with biotechnology but also with ecology, with quantum physics and so on. And Adam Brown has uh, restaged the making of toxic green paint from a recipe of the 18th century. And the toxins of the first green, bright, light, fast pigment then is being remediated um, as a reference of Van Gogh painting by extremal for bacteria that also are capable of decomposing that. So what I call green studies also is a kind of attempt to deconstruct anthropocentrism. And of course, I think uh, uh, Jin Jun will talk about his installation and we talked about greenness which is a common trope that we would like to discuss and how for what does mean green and in how far is it possible that it evokes both artificiality and naturality about uh, toxicity and healthy and this ambiguity is at the core of studies that I'm conducting since now more than 30 years since more than 30 years I um, actually collect everything that has to do with green and of course green what is green we all know what green is right but no maybe we not i mean what is green we see a plant green only because it's uh, actually rejecting um, uh, the, the the spectrum that human animals identify as green and it's reflected as waste so to say because the plant conducts photosynthesis because of its red and blue photons that are highly energetic but reject the green spectrum so what we see as green is not the plant we see the waste of the plant so to say which leads to a fundamental philosophical and ontological misunderstanding that the plant is green of course a plant is not green and if you ask your dog it can even not see green because it doesn't evolve to have a green red distinction so color naming and especially green is very much to anthropocentrism. Um, I like to start with this image of green aliens, of course, naturally green and observing these yellow flames and orange ambers on the only rudimentary planet here in a caricature and a cartoon from, um, from 100 years ago and saying, oh, what do the earthlings do? I think they are probably developing strategies 
to finish the cooling of the planet. And this is from a cartoon from August Roby from 1918, uh, the first world war seen from other planets. So it's very interesting to feel whether today we have kind of increase in unwanted greenness because of all the toxic algae, the aliens would still feel alienated. Um, this very interesting film um, that is uh, been shot by uh, Richard Mose and was a very fantastic display at the last Alice Electronica Festival about all the damage of the Amazon but shot with spectral cameras and of course the damage is more visible when you use it, shoot, shoot it with, um, with scientific instruments. On the other hand, Colombian director Shiro Guerra has shot on purpose the whole film um, about um, uh, Western explorers and colonization in the Amazonas, El Abrazo de la Serpiente, the Embrace of the Serpent, in black and white. And one reason is that for indigenous people, there are more than 50 words to say green, and that also technical equipment is not able to actually sense this complexity of the green. So for me, uh, green is a, is a necropolitical colors. We published this pamphlet in the aesthetics of necropolitics because we think that artists have a role to work on the disconstruction of um, affirmative kind of um, yeah, affirmative aesthetics and go against the grain. So of course we have always had that. We had uh, this coloring of the green uh, Canela Grando by Nicola uh, Oruburu. We have Eliasson's coloring and uh, supposedly having an ecological meaning. But we also have the toxicity in art history leading to hmm, what the first pigment was that was light fast was arsenic based. And we have to ask a question in the arsenic century, how many painters that went out with hand the metal tubes poisoned them actually by trying to represent nature. And actually the impressionist shows the pigment called Paris green and it was also at the same time a red poison. So this was used in Adam Brown's evocation here in Shadows from the Walls of Death to actually recreate this historical pigment to repaint all these historical wallpapers and also to then paint a Van Gogh image reminiscent of this window image in his uh, Salon à Coucher, which is the only color that didn't fade over time. The green was so stable and toxic that it, couldn't, it could resist time. So, is this just about language? I mean, I'm interested also in Asian language, so maybe this is an offer for collaboration. In very often in languages, um, green, blue color terms do merge into grew terms, and it depends where you put the barrier between them. And um, it's very much about um, how also the scientists use uh, green as different metaphors. You have green chemistry, biotechnology, so it stands in for sustainability. But when you go to the climate science, they are complaining, oh, we are greening the earth. And it's a catastrophe because it indicates a CO2, anthropogenic CO2 pollution resulting in an unwanted greening of the planet. So if you ask a climate scientist if greening is good, he will probably tell you the opposite. And um, this is about the greening the earth on the drivers. It's just not very positive. We are also greening the media and we also try to go over all the toxic conditions that are uh, in open mining, in factory conditions, in some factories um, we don't want or need to name, but all this toxic fabrication of our very clean digital tools, which also are part of this strategy of greening the media. So what I want to say is that we have a huge uh, arsenal of disciplines that come into mind when we want to deconstruct greenness and as an anthropocentric color, and this is an invitation to join that. We had just finished a EU project three years of greenness studies and also have a publication if somebody's interested here, also depicting installations and exhibitions such as at the National Art Museum in Riga or in the Burj Art Museum. And uh, if you would like to have a look at the copy, I have one here with me. Green AI, of course, is a topic also, which is a different one. But what is green AI? Is it about developing ecological futures or is it to bring the energy cost of the AI down? I have a student at Sorbonne University. He is 20 years old. He is very queer. And this generation tells me, 
you know, I limited my use of AI today to 30 minutes because it produces too much CO2. And I think this generation is thinking about ecological consequences of our digital tools and how we are greening the world. So, thank you.